Welcome, welcome everyone to this uh, sixth day, the final day <clears throat> of our Dharma sharing this time. And once again, I'm full of appreciation and rejoicement for this opportunity. And uh, I hope this was also of some use benefit to you like it has been to me. And uh, yes, uh, like, like all these previous days, we will uh, use the first few minutes in meditation and uh, to call upon you to find yourself in a comfortable position. Unless it is a problem, it would be good to have the backs upright, heads kind of slightly bent with the eyes either gently closed or semi-open, in which case you would like to place the gaze at the tip of the nose or a feet or two in front of you. Hands in any gestures that you feel comfortable. Once you have the physical postures in place. Let the mind have a general sense of your being, general sense of your presence through the sensations of the body, particularly sensations of touch associated with parts of the body touching the ground part of them under your feet, feeling the ground, seated as you are, feeling the sensation there. Hence, in the gestures, they are, as they are touching either your knees or hands in a folded position, just take note of the general texture of the touch without giving into any judgment. If there is any need for adjustment, allow yourself to do that. So is the case with any part of the body. If you are feeling uncomfortable, unease, anywhere, even the slightest tension, feel like you visit there, soothe it out and come, go past that into sensing the general sensations of the body here in the real time. Through that, registering one's presence and remembering the occasion, the topic we are studying, the lessons we have learned or heard or have more to dig deep into reflect over, come to terms with, etc. in the past few days. Just take note of the situation at hand within the context of the few days of Dharma sharing. And then come to this present moment reaffirming the purpose behind this. Try to generate a sense of affirmation that yes, this is the worthy thing to be doing, right thing, worthy thing to be doing. And feel more inspired and convinced. This feel more inspired and decided in using the occasion to the optimum. So that one could reap the benefit, benefit in the truest sense that will go a long way 
in making a big difference in one's own life and in the longer run, as well as through that to others. Gathering thoughts around these feel once again inspired, motivated, complemented with a sense of delight, joy. With this note, let's now take three rounds of deep, deliberate breathing, which we will do together at my signal. Breathing in through the nostrils and out through the mouth. By breathing deep, deliberate in a measured way, pausing in between if need be, and then releasing it all out. In the course of which, we try to anchor our attention to the breathing, even if when we do this, in this deep, deliberate, intentional form, generating a sense of groundedness, gathering the mind from external thoughts, external distractions. So let's begin with the in-breath. Now slowly let the breathing settle into a natural rhythm. Taking your time and slowly but gradually adjusting the breathing process to settle into a more natural flow. Where you allow it to take place in however way it requires to be without trying to regulate or impose any specific force, rhythm, length, none of that. Let it be just however it naturally requires to be, even if it means uneven breathing in between. Let it be, just let it be. All we do is try to stay connected with it through our staying aware of the sensations associated with the breathing, while at the same time not giving in to any temptations of judging over them, trying to fix something, figure out something, worrying over whether one is doing right or not. Let go of all of them. Instead, just stay connected with the breathing. Look forward to getting to travel lightly with the natural breathing. Walking hand in hand with it, with nothing but to be aware of it. And in staying aware of it, do so qualitatively. Bringing in elements of alertness. attention, enthusiasm, all combined together in being with the breath. One breath at a time, round after round, for as long as one can. Whenever one loses track of it, and one recognizes that, Again, be gentle to oneself. Do not make fuss over it. Do not get mad over it. But rather merely realistically acknowledge that. And remember to bring the mind back to the breathing. And start over again. 
So let's take two rounds of deep, deliberate breathing here. Bring in and out of the nostrils. Coming back, let's settle the breathing through its natural rhythm and carry on with our meditation. With our best effort in having all those factors in place. Remember to strike the balance between pushing too hard and being too careless. Stay with the breath. This is not so much about thinking of the breath, but rather feeling it, being it. I'm totally in sync with it. Attuned to the natural process of breathing, feeling the sensations. Just being fully present here and now with the attention going nowhere, but on the real time natural breathing, fully contented being in the present moment, neither giving into any feeling of rush, nor letting it wander after things in the past or of the future or even if things around here and now, other than breathing, let go of all of that. Be fully with the breath, natural breath. Just as our body is squarely on our respective seats, see if we could let the mind contently, comfortably stay within the body with nothing but the breath to stay aware of that it tries to do with full attention, alertness, enthusiasm. Now slowly let go of his focus on the breath. Let's recollect what we did yesterday in our meditation. We began with looking at our own present situation, situation, conditions in this life, in terms of our predispositions, our reactiveness, our almost automatic reaction to situations, first and foremost, with negative readings, negative interpretations, negative assumptions. Take stock of them. Even remember 
the creations when under their spell. One had incurred missteps that had consequences to clean up, that had consequences that spilled over others, and some maybe even still lingering today. Trace these series of happenings back to that moment of unquestioned miscalculation, unquestioned misreading. And trace that further into so strongly ingrained sense of self-obsession, self-importance over and beyond sensibility. That in turn being so completely colored, saturated with this unquestioned assumption for anything associated with that situation, anything within the purview of that mind to almost having an independent, inherent identity of their own including how oneself appeared to that mind, the actions from others, the notion of the others, how one projected what might have been leading to that. See how all of the perspectives, all of them, Images appeared almost self-enclosed, cut out, independent, unconnected. Each one of them almost capable of setting itself up into what one projected them to be, in and of themselves, by their own self-power. And how these ingrained conceptions, ingrained notions, do not seem to lend themselves to a point of origin, a point of training, point of learning in this life. Still wondering where could this have come from? Where could I have picked it up? And then with those as the basis, how each one of us, even within the single family, is so different. So different in how we express them. So different in how we reflect them. how we play them out. Yet deep down, there's also this aspiration to have happiness, nothing but happiness, nothing but peace, nothing but joy. And in a way, all the moves that we make seem to be driven by that motivation. Of course, inescapably colored, touched, influenced 
by those two main culprits in the form of self-centeredness, self-obsession on the one hand, and this unquestioned projection of independent entities to just about every player in any particular situation. Nonetheless, every move is driven by this aspiration for joy and happiness, rightfully placed, reasonably formed, justifiable. Yet something goes wrong, something go of kintle, of kilter in the meantime, when it comes to choosing means and methods by which to claim and materialize, fulfill that so justified, reasonable, rightful aspiration. For sure, we are to blame these culprits there which are lurking in the corners of our mind, some in the very core of our mind, together with this aspiration that immediately jump into action and mess things up, take things to their own interest and ruin the whole project that begins from such a pure, rightful aspiration. And then even allowing that we now come to our senses and begin to question these, begin to wonder why something's always getting wrong, going wrong. And then beginning to finally find some ways out of it, beginning to figure out the mechanism of them, where things go wrong, how things could be changed. Where are the gaps of opportunity? Even knowing that, to the extent we do with our own efforts and luck in coming upon teachings, people sharing, caring to share these insights. Nonetheless, the efforts to follow up on them seem to be uphill tasks. Again, this is a question mark. Why is this so? At the same time, any effort, every effort has definitely made a, mis made a difference. Now one is more easy to recognize them more easy to caution oneself. Sometimes one succeeds in really catching oneself in the moment and keeping oneself proceeding further. Sometimes we may be late in catching them, but we do catch them and cut short the damage. So these are signs of hope that we have experienced on our own person. take some joy in this and feel even more determined ever to stay put and persist in this. Never give in to any let up to this effort for there is now the chance, the opportunity to turn over the negative regime on us. Who we have lately recognized, understood, found out to have very feeble, unrealistic, fictitious foundation. If only we could stick with our efforts, there is no question for this system 
to fall. Let's now take a moment here in wondering what the situ situation might be for others. So far we have seen this in our own person. Wonder about others around us. All over. In different countries, different cultures, different time. Think of human beings to begin with. And then slowly extend that to all the rest of the sentient beings. Things or beings, things or phenomena that are embedded with this, this unique entity called sentience, unique entity called mind, feeling, experiencing, thinking, planning, no matter how varied we may be in terms of the scales, the dynamics, the sophistication, whatnot, but nonetheless, this entity called mind, thinking agent, experiencing agent, reflective agent, subjective agent. So long as anything, how minute, how giant, how big, humongous, it may be so long as they have this, they all seem to share in this aspiration for joy and happiness and seem to be at the very least sharing in these negative rules over them, judging from the actions, things they go through, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Seems like on those fundamental areas we are not different. So we all want happiness and do not want suffering. Just as we do not question that on ourselves, we should not be questioning it on others. Instead, we should be as much affirming that as we do for ourselves. Nothing more, nothing less. There should not be any kind of disparity in how we allow for that to be the fact. On top of that, we are dependent on each other. Although it, when it comes to thinking of ourselves, relating to ourselves, we have this, we have this embedded natural sense of care, natural sense of closeness to ourselves. But how, what about others? We do not seem to have that equally distributed among others. For whatever reasons, we have more towards some, less towards some. How justified is that? How right is that? In terms of, on, one gra on, on what ground do we justify that? It almost seems like an arbitrary decision. Or in, or in other sense, not even a decision, an intentional decision just arbitrary impulsiveness, impulsive, compulsive reaction that in turn do not have any sound ground. Whenever there's a slight shift there, that whole structure that seemed to be so affirmed and so forthcoming tumbles down see how our relationships with our very dear and near ones and parents and whatnot takes a totally 180 degree turn with the slightest twist in situation, the slightest, sometimes with the slightest twitch of thoughts, ideas, influence, whatnot. 
So even that sense of care that we have to some few, even that is not well grounded. We have not done a good job in really building any good foundation for any good thing that seem to come out of us. That they seem to be so delicate, so unpredictable. Whereas in reality, everything that we are is due to others. Beginning from the body that we have, we didn't have that. It started out from our parents. How we have unquestionably claimed it. And the parents have always, never ever claimed it. Never ever put a question to that. And how do we then go forth from there? And then if the body is others, what else do we have that belongs to us that we can say it is ours? Everything that we achieve through the body would as well be due to others. And then every step of life, we depend on others. It's not this single moment that we do not depend on others, that we do not stand on the shoulders of others. That is the reality. It's not something being faked up, being made up here. That is the reality, except for our reflection on it, except for our courage to encounter it, to face with it. The list can go on and on and on. Just take one thing we can really think of how others have knowingly, unknowingly, with vested interest, self-interest, or other interest, whatsoever. But we are at the receiving end. We are receiving the benefit. And then with our slight added effort, insight, whatnot, we can even turn it into very significant things but the very fundamental base is provided by the others. And when we aspire for spiritual awakening development to our present theme of great compassion leading to Bodhicitta, the wonderful, the wondrous, the wonderful gem that we can give rise to, eventually flowering into those beautiful actions of perfections leading to perfected state of full awakening, endowed with all those qualities that we have even difficulty imagining. Those are all dependent on others. I remember very clearly in the Abhid, in the Bodhicitta, Bodhisattva Chara Tara, where the author challenges us. He says that for all these practices to succeed, we need patience. And patience is not just dependent on others, more particularly the di difficult others, but rather the difficult others, the so shunned people, so put off people to us. They are the cause, not just condition, they are the cause for our practice of patience. If it weren't for them, there wouldn't be a practice of patience to build, to form in the first place. And there the author really takes time in first explaining what causal relation should be, what causal relation looks like. He really goes into the nitty gritty details saying, causal relation is such, that the cause, that what we understand as cause precedes what we recognize as effect. Not only that, between them, there is a relationship of necessary presence and absence. For there to be the so-called effect, it is necessary for the cause to have been present before it. If it weren't for the cause being present before it, there would be no question no topic, no thought, no possibility of the effect. And then he goes on to saying, yes, when it comes to the practice of patience, 
the difficult objects of our relationship, the so-called enemies. Although the text says enemies, and we sometimes kind of, kind of, uh, kind of, uh, what do you call? Uh, deal with it almost like it, it doesn't, it, although almost it is non-applicable to oneself because there is no enemy. No, that's just, that's for calling the object. But for us, someone who says something wrong is enough of an enemy for that moment and for that duration when we kind of linger on that, when we kind of hang on to that, uh, latch on to that. That's enough for someone to be that object that really puts us off. In some cases, they can be very strongly, strongly built such animosity and whatnot. But nonetheless, all of this counts for what we call someone that puts us off. And they are essential for us to train and build in our strength of patience. They are the cause without which the result cannot be. And in the absence of patience, none of the practices that we aspire to achieve can ever take sound ground. Think of those different types of patience, tolerance, practice, each having its own resonance, necessity for all of these other practices of morality, concentration, oh, for sure, wisdom, generosity, all of this. Even for the practice of patience itself, some amount of patience is required. And that we cannot develop from anybody else but having the so called worthless, ever to be shunned, down, looked over, downgraded, looked over, looked up, what do you call? So such such a being, just the very fact that they didn't mean to benefit you itself makes them into this unique, precious, without precious object without which you cannot practice. It's almost like they are putting themselves up, setting themselves up into this uncomfortable situation of being the enemy, of harboring hatred, jealousy, greed within them. And thus all of those consequences, all of those ramifications of negative effect, they harbor this, they, they, they put up with this, and then the actions that spring out from that, that harms them, their own peace in the family, and then beyond that. So that we could now have this object For us to practice. And this is just an example of how, even without touching, without considering life before and life after, just this present life at hand is enough to see how we are so inextricably connected. And not just connected, but how we are through these connections benefiting from them and have and, and find ourselves in a position to benefit immensely, if only we care to and we rise to the occasion. So thinking along these lines, we would have no choice but to really generate, grow in our sense of preciousness towards them, in our sense of cherishing towards them, in our sense of belovedness towards them. And when that gains ground, then attitudes like love, compassion, joy, equanimity, all of those would look like, of course, kind of a reaction, of course, kind of a way of relating to them. Let's celebrate this prospect. 
this possibility that it can be ours for us to realize, materialize within ourselves, grow into, and that ourselves blossom into this beauty, unexcelled beauty, impeccable beauty of heart complemented with as smart, intelligent, insightful wisdom. Through that, our world will be completely transformed. So would those around us and beyond. Let's revel in this possibility, in this prospect and make firm determination to deliver on this, to utilize every moment ahead of us, to only contribute to that, to only connect with that and contribute to that. So that this pull with every step every moment grows and grows, grows eventually to its full potential. And now, whenever you are ready, feel free to come out of the meditation at your convenience, your ease, by opening your eyes or lifting your gaze. Okay, so I will share the screen. Oh, Uh, so, so before taking up any specific stanza here, I want to uh, share some general thoughts about this topic that we may or may not have the right point to bring them up. It may do so in the later stanzas, but up until now, we haven't necessarily touched on how to generate compassion, right? So how to generate compassion? So I'm sharing another screen. You see the other screen, right? Okay, so uh, let me let me try.
I don't know how to do this. Uh, okay. Gashala, there is a present button in the bottom right hand corner next to the plus and minus sign. Next to the plus button. and minus sign? Yeah, at the bottom right there. Try that. Oh, to the left of that. There you have it. Now, is it okay? Uh, to the left of that. Okay, to the other, in the other direction. Oh, I see. And in the other direction. So what is it? Go, go to the bottom um, right hand corner and see that the one closest to the minus minus sign. Oh, okay. The, that one, yes. That should. There we go. Yeah, but with that, part of the screen is blocked by this. With by this. We're, we're seeing it nice and clearly. We're seeing the whole presentation. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, very, okay. that's very nice on our side. Okay. Yeah. I did this presentation uh, to, to a group of monastics in the Pali and Sanskrit tradition. So I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but here in Kamala Shila stages of meditation, he says, moistened by loving kindness, your mind becomes, now, now the problem is I cannot see it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, mind becomes like friable, fertile soil. When you plant the seed of compassion, it grows easily and bountifully. Therefore, after you infuse your mind, with loving kindness, cultivate compassion. Of course, here, when he meant loving kindness, he's speaking of the loving kindness, the cherishing, cherishing love, the loving kindness, the love that sees others as cherished and beloved. So first we have to train in that. And that's what we were trying to do through our meditation, in our meditation by, by thinking of, the role the others play in our life, how we are indebted to them, how we are beneficiaries of their efforts. So reflecting on that, we, we, have, we would have no choice but to break through our sense of resentment or sense of distance, kind of bring them close to one's one heart and begin to see them in the light of being some, something cherishable, appealing, appe uh, appealing and uh, attractive. Like everyone would have that kind of a perspective towards their beloved ones, right? Be that their parents, friends, teachers, whatever. Someone towards whom you have no difficulty in bringing up how you much you benefited from them, how much they meant to you. So, so when one has that kind of a thought, and this, what do you call awakening, then irrespective of how that person may outwardly look, et cetera, that will be appealing to you, right? So that sense of cherish, that is the loving kindness. Also in the, in the case of seven point cause and effect interaction, that would be the the fourth one, right? And then following that is compassion, great compassion or compassion. So moistened by loving kindness, your mind becomes like friable, fertile soil. So your mind is like the ground, the fertile, the, the ground, which when it is moistened, 
by an agent, then it becomes friable and fertile. And that's what happens when we bring in loving kindness, the kindness that sees others in this, in this, in this aspect of cherished, beloved ones. And usually, mainly, that has to come from our reflection, contemplation, internalization, and kind of almost uh, living, becoming a living sense that we carry around us, uh, a sense of their kindness. Although we say kindness, kindness doesn't have to be something that was given by others, that was done by others, executed by others with a sense of kindness, not necessarily kindness in terms of how it turns out to be, not how it has been, how it has been generated, but rather how, when it comes to you, it turns out to be. particularly in the case of enemy, for them to be that rare, but rare, but viable object, necessary object for training in, in, in patience, they cannot afford to have kindness towards us, project kindness towards us, then the whole project will fall apart <laughs> they have to suffer for us with their with their negativity within them and kind of really acting it out in the sincerest way only then that serves as that what shantideva calls the cause for the un avoidable cause uh, for practice of patience. Okay, when you plant the seed of compassion, it grows easily and bountifully. Therefore, after you infuse your mind with loving kindness, cultivate compassion. So this is how Tsongkhapa in the, in the uh, treatise, in the, in, the, in the great treatise on the stages of the path, Lam Rim, explains this out. He brings in the element of impartiality to begin with, which is what, which is what uh, was uh, uh, was was uh, anticipated even in 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 the way uh, Kamala Sheila presented it. But I just quote it just from where the part about the loving kindness was. So by cultivating impartiality, you eliminate the unevenness in attitude that comes from the bias of your attachment and hostility. So first, before you water, before you dampen, moisten the soil, first one has to get rid of the unwanted bumps and unwanted bumps and dents there, kind of level it out particularly get the soil kind of soft and then break them even whatnot. So that's like the impartiality. By cultivating impartiality, you eliminate the unevenness in attitude that comes from the bias of your attachment and hostility. So, so the kind of compassion that we claim to have towards our dear one and was are, are questionable to be actual compassion because they are built on the bumps and the dents our hostility towards others is based on the dents on our, from our uh, mental surface. And then the so-called compassion that kind of stands out and uh, kind of being poured uh, over ones, near ones and dear ones uh, in an exclusive way. Those are built on some already, those are high, not because they are no, not because the actual structure of the love was high. It was built on a already the elevated structure of the attachment. <laughs> and then it percolates into it. So, so that's why it, it is not enough. 
because in a way these bumps and dents themselves though in though temporarily in the form of attachment and hostility towards different different groups of people they themselves can can the two can themselves can what do you call feed each other with the attachment strong, growing stronger and stronger and the hostility stronger and stronger, kind of pulling ourselves apart, deeper and stronger, but not only to be ripe, to become more ripe, to, to bring in problems, sufferings to oneself and to others, because anything that you throw to others, it is bound to bounce back. <laughs> okay, so that's why there's the need of first, practicing the impartiality. And your mind becomes like a good field, good level field. Kamala Shila says here that if you then moisten your mind with the water of loving kindness, which views all living beings with affection, cherishing, seen as cherishing, that is the love that views others as cherishing, as, as cherished, as beloved. And then plant the healthy seed of compassion. You will easily generate great compassion, right? You plant the seed of compassion, no matter in its very fledgling form, whatnot, then that can grow into great compassion. Only when you have this level field of impartiality upon which the water of loving kindness has been sprinkled. So here the loving kindness is, it, we, it is the cherishing love, the right cherishing love, love that we use to living beings with affection. And it is grounded on universal reasons, not just bias reasons, but universal reasons that apply to everyone, like we did about wanting happiness, not wanting suffering, and how they contribute to our life. Of course, in different ways, but that's what we exactly need. If everyone were to provide us with just one type of things, we would have something too much and nothing of others. But thank for their diversity, for their di diverse activity, diverse roles and whatnot, that we get this assorted benefit, assorted help from them. And in this, in this, in this regard, we didn't have to believe them, we didn't have to do anything on our part. They, by, their, by themselves, in whatever way they are, be that in an animosity group, in a neutral group, in a beloved group, loving group, etc., etc. They are by themselves, in whatever they are, and however they may shift in between, it's fine for us to always provide us with the assorted benefit that we can benefit from. And in this, some have nothing but to lose and suffer, but keep keep maintaining that that keep maintaining intact that position, that condition of that condition of being. It's almost like being the legendary legendary milking cow that we can always milk benefit from them. <laughs> okay, so let's see. Uh, yep, I, I will not go through this. I mentioned this, that doesn't matter. Yeah, so this, so there are two kinds of loving kindness that considers living beings to be cherished, beloved. Of course, when we are speaking of loving kindness, all of this, they are to be grounded on universal reason, universal ground, so that there would be the prospect of growing and equitably to all. Because the more it does, the better off we will be, the better off others will be. It's like a win-win situation. Otherwise, even if it be a loving kindness or not, so long as we kind of double down on that, uh, so long as it is partial and whatnot and kind of uh, partially, mm, uh, 
<coughs> informed personally, pardon? So long as it is based, founded on a partial ground, the more we double down on it, the, the worse of we will be, the worse of the entire society will be. And besides that, it would always lack that stable ground, like we saw in the case of how, 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 I don't know what, what's the English term. Okay, I know now what to look for next time. <laughs> uh, how a heartfelt friend yesterday could turn into the worst enemy today, right? And how we ourselves go through such a topsy-turvy of emotional change with real, real effect. But those are great sign of how that seemingly so strong love, right? Even to oneself and to others was founded on a very, very unstable, feeble ground. No more applicable as soon as the situation changes. But when we found this on this universal, then the superficial changes will not change them. Okay, so, so there is this loving kindness that wishes beings to have, that others, that wishes others beings to have happiness or the causes of happiness, what not. So, so, so these are the two loving kindness that needs to be sorted out and compassion that compassion is usually as defined in this in this spirit so there's no such thing i mean at least we could come up with with an attitude and call it compassion but has the nature of considering others to be cherished or what not that is fine there's nothing with a level but at the moment we are using them to stand for these attitudes and based on that the scriptures have laid out those instructions and thus how we understand ha has to be has to map up map up with what the scriptures are basing on so that we could understand it so based on that compassion is only defined in this one way whereas loving kindness right chamba is 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 presented in these two forms and based on that uh, we would be relating to it differently, separately, uh, in terms of the mechanism of how to cultivate compassion, growing into great compassion, what their roles are. So the causal relationship between compassion and loving kindness, that is the wish for beings to have happiness, that is, there is no definite causal relationship, rather the potential for both of them grow at the same time. It's just a matter of what happens to manifest on the surface of the mind, be it either in the form of compassion or in the form of this loving kindness, wishing others to happiness. Otherwise, in terms of the potential to generate either of them in, a, in, in, a, in, in respect, in regard to a particular situation, the potential would already have been generated with the generation of the other. Yeah, I want to, I want to dwell on this, uh, drawing from our question about where anger fits in in the in the in the metrics of the non-virtues, whatnot. So this. This stanza, uh, let, let me indulge here to, to read out the Pali. Saba papas akaranam kusalas upasampata sachit pariyodapanam etam budam anusasanam. I used to sing and I, I do occasionally. Yeah, I have, I have my own moments of joy. <laughs> Saba papas. Akaranam kusalas upasampada sachid pariyodapanam etam budam anusasanam. So, 
this rendition here, which is very close to the original here, I mean, the closest I have found, uh, is very, very telling of, of, of what we are trying to make uh, a distinction between um, actions and afflictions. So, so the, the whole purpose of Dharma teaching is so that we could realize our un, unquestioned, rightful, fundamental, justified aspiration for genuine joy and happiness and to be freed from sufferings, unwanted things. And for them, for those two, it takes for their respective causes to be cultivated to actually achieve them merely wishing. Wishing for them is not enough, nor mere motion of doing something with the hope of getting there necessarily gets there. So one has to be aware of what actually it takes for some result to come by seeing the resonance, the correlation between the cause and the effect, and thereby, thereby intentionally cultivate those causes for the desired effect to come. So in regard to joy and happiness, right? In regard to joy and happiness, it takes wholesome, wholesome actions to be performed, to be cultivated, to be strengthened, built, habituated into. And when it comes to the unwanted situations, it takes for us to abandon, avoid, eliminate unwholesome actions. But merely knowing this is not going to be enough when it comes to really making effort, things will go topsy-turvy. Things will not go the way we want it. There would always be something that we trip over. And that's because the mind still remains to be tamed, disciplined. And thus one has to, so in, the, in, in, this, in this context of wholesome and unwholesome actions, they spring from their respective mental grounds of afflictions or mental grounds of afflictions or uh, in, in the case of positive actions, of course afflictions, but not necessarily the ones that we usually associate afflictions with, rather afflictions in the form of self-centeredness, self-grasping, projecting permanence, projecting unfounded purity in things, etc. They are afflictions from the Prasangika Madhamika point of view. Even what constitutes affliction undergoes a progressive shift in terms of becoming more inclusive, more deeper, etc. etc. So so even, so that's the reason why I, I, I'm critical of using the term afflicted emotion, destructive emotion for Kalesha, because F Kalesha is not always, not only F emotions. It has cognitive components. It has cognitive aspects of them. The so self-grasping itself is considered an affliction, Kalesha, although in English, because one has, I mean, it takes, time to kind of be habituated into it, to kind of uh, attuned into it so that it's itself kind of takes a life of its own, right? Uh, kind of a meaning of its own. Otherwise, uh, yeah, so in the meantime, uh, the, the, the word though meant to, you, meant to mean a specific thing may kind of uh, maybe, may mean that, but at the same time uh, point to other things. So it's it's not that it's not that fine tuned, or, or or at least how we how we receive that it's it, it doesn't uh, uh, it doesn't come as that defined. I mean that that would have I can imagine that would have been the same thing with Nyumong in Tibetan because Nyumong particularly uh, 
by itself means literally means that which gives us a hard time. That which gives us a difficult time. So if you say new moon, some, somebody may point to a person and say, oh, so he is the new moon to me because he gives me a hard time. <laughs> but new moon is never a person. It's always a mental. So I can, I can uh, relate to that, relate to that depending on the, the, the period of evolution. But anyway, subdue your mind completely. So this is saying that mind can be subdued completely tamed completely, right? And it's through that, that one can deal with the causal, uh, causal foundations or basis for these uh, actions that, that, that spring up on the surface. And then, and yeah, so, so even this text itself is, can be used to say, yes, Action, but when we say actions, mental, even mental actions, uh, verbal actions and physical actions, they are already a step, a step beyond the afflictions. They're already a step above the afflictions. So we are already, pres what you call presuming an affliction or uh, corresponding uh, mental level that's responsible for tri triggering uh, that. Now we spoke, the question was specifically about if I, if I may use this other term, wholesome, unwholesome, or virtuous, non-virtuous. Non Interestingly, when it comes to virtue, non-virtue, wholesome, unwholesome, there can be, even among the afflictions that are unwholesome, even among the mental, mental, uh, mental factors or, or mental states, that, that would belong to this foundational level in regard to actions that they give rise to, even among them, there can be wholesome ones, but they will not be called wholesome action. Anger is not an action, at least, or although, although I, was, I, was being, I was taking exception to the use of anger and then, and then say and equated, equated with the, the equivalent of, of hatred, that's what I was taking exception to. So that's why uh, it may be an open question as to whether, whether it is an action or a, or, or a mental state, uh, or not, not mental state, or a kalesha, but take the undisputed topics, undisputed examples like hatred and whatnot. We, co we consider them affliction or kalesha, not action. Hatred itself is not an action in this context. But hatred is an unwholesome, is unwholesome. Some can be, some of the afflictions can be neutral. Even affliction, even calculation can be neutral. Some can be unwholesome. But they are not counted among the mental, physical, or verbal actions. Actions are a step beyond that. So that's why sometimes people these days say, of course, in certain contexts, it, it will be applicable. But if you are supposed to be teaching Buddhism, right? Presenting the Buddhist stand, then I think even calling afflictions or the glaciers as natural, is little problematic. It's like mixing things together. Of course, it will go well if you say, oh, these are natural. Don't worry about them. There are, there are situations when they will, that, that will work, that, that will resonate. But if you say that's the Buddhist stand, I don't know. I, I have questions about that. Because when you say they are natural, it seems to be really giving them, uh, what do you call, giving them a, almost like a free hand, almost like an excuse, like there's nothing wrong with that and you have to put up with it. There's nothing you can do with it, almost some kind of, that kind of a connotation there. 
it has grown so much that it may look like natural that you have hardly any chance, hardly any say in when it would arise or not. But that doesn't necessarily have to be always the case. So this is just an example of how sometimes we, at least I may be wrong in my assessment, but we seem to be mixing things. That's the reason why I was uh, kind of uh, making this uh, point, uh, emphasizing it, then saying that, yes, uh, must present Buddhist teachings within the scheme, uh, because there is, there is a order uh, or, or a, line of what do you call it? a thread of reasoning a sector that connects uh, and and uh, thus messing with one can affect others though it may not seem like that so that that that's that and and then i was alluding to, to what uh, i think maitreya or asanga in one of his texts really uh, raises this point saying please please don't mess up with buddha's teaching you may do so but but with the disclaimer that that's what your opinion is, et cetera, but not what Buddha's teaching is. Because, yeah, because in that, unless you are sure in what Buddha's presence, he is more knowledgeable than we are. And we cannot mess up with that. Do try to understand how he presents, what are the reasons, what not, and then present them. So that was just a side, side comment, but uh, I was, commenting on what I left, uh, uh, left away with when that question about the wholesome, unwholesome actions came up. And then, yes, even with what we call harmful, uh, hum, what was that? Uh, harmful intention, uh, covetousness, and wrong view when it comes to the mental actions, they are not that not that simple. It, it takes for a specific, uh, what do you call, specific, uh, if you will, uh, round of a, specific, a kind of a particular definite round of habituation or repetition or something uh, by which a particular action becomes uh, what we call covetousness within this scheme of the eight of, of the 10 non wedged actions, not just any, any, any instance of coveting necessarily counts for that. So is the case with the harmful intention. And so if we understand them for what they are within that context, then we'll be able to uh, associate them with the gravity that they are associated with in the scriptures. Otherwise, we come up with our own understanding of what it is, and then are confronted with the gravity that they are kind of uh, uh, what, uh, they are matched with, and then say, "Oh, there is a mismatch," uh, like that. So that's what I was pointing at. Okay, so this is my favorite in 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 uh, in the Dhammapad. Dhammapad words. 160. Please let me indulge in singing this. Atahi atano nato, koi nato parosia, atana hi sudante na, natam labati dulabam. So beautiful, so beautiful. Yeah, this is wonderful. This is the stanza. Of course, in the Abhidhamma, uh, in, 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 in the Dhammapad, each Dhammapad stanza or two, three of them in groups represents a particular episode in the life of Buddha. And there are stories around it, right? So this one has to do with, uh, do, do with the relation, relationship between a mother and a child. Both of them now ordained, but the mother got ordained before she gave birth to this child. Soon after she was ordained, she began to show signs of having bearing child in her womb. 
There was a big controversy. How come? How did this happen? Etc. Etc. Et did that incur incur transgression? All of that, and eventually, Buddha didn't Buddha didn't meddle in this situation. He let uh, a, a, a independent inquiry happen. This is so interesting, and through that, it was revealed that she had gotten pregnant before she had order ordained. That was not a case of incurring the defeat. So when she then she was allowed to carry uh, carry the baby to term and then give birth. It was all cared for in the in the in the ashram itself. So wonderful. And then when when the child grew grew up, he he also was uh, ordained. But the mother, mother, had still was lingering in her motherly love or motherly attachment, expecting a similar, similar reaction, etc., from the child. And the child, a well developed, well matured Dharma practitioner, began to sense that he he needed to teach a lesson. So he deliberately, deliberately kind of turned away from responding in the conventional attached way, etc. And that kind of put her off, took her by surprise. And then the issue became so strong, so, so grave that it was brought to Buddha's attention. <coughs> Buddha said it was not the fault of the son. She was blaming, I when become, I have been this word by because of him, like that, right? in our own conventional way. There's no one indeed is one's own protector. You can protect yourself despite how the child is behaving towards you. The child cannot control you. He is not controlling you as much as you think he is. How can others be protected to you? In, in, in other translation, uh, it uses the term refuge also, but sometimes it is quite misleading. It's like saying, oh, Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha are not even your protector or refuge. Yourself is your protector. So that's the reason why I use protector here. But even in the case of these three jewels also, it's by, in, 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 by generating Dharma within yourself that you actually become protected. The Sangha and Buddha can only do so much, but in terms of actual, actual protection, it has to be through one's own effort in generating Dharma. Not maybe, not necessarily right away, the, the actual Dharma from the in the in the sense of this uh, uh, true cessation and a true path that an aria would have aria point of becoming aria and beyond would have but any effort towards that is protecting us in its own in its own uh, corresponding level so how can others be protected to one be with just oneself thoroughly tamed? One attains the hard to find protector, protection. It is so hard to find, but all it takes is for oneself. No, no, nobody else, but just oneself being becoming thoroughly tamed. Then what at one point looked like so hard to attain would have been uh, obtained. So yeah, this is let me let me indulge once again to sing it. Please, please, please. I hope I have your permission. Atahi ata no na to koi na to parosia ata na hi sudhan te na na sam labati dulabam. Okay, please protect yourself. We have break here. <laughs> Welcome back. 
<coughs> before before we move on, I want to say something about here. Or maybe the previous one, maybe. Yeah, it's, it's the same. So it emphasizes taming oneself or taming one's mind, which are the same thing. It is in the taming of the mind, in the taming of oneself, that's where the role of Buddha and the Sangha comes in. Because we are not fully capable of undertaking it by ourselves. Although that's the only way by which we could improve our situation, Buddha can do this for us. But in knowing how to do it, that's where the role of Buddha and Sangha comes in. In the case of the Buddha as the ultimate reliable, fully reliable experience, caring, right? Caring, fully compassionate, fully knowing, and completely unbiased, caring teacher to rely on, and the Sangha at their respective levels of achievement as an unreliable company to look up to, to feel encouraged by, to kind of almost, almost catch up and thus kind of get the incentive and practice required from someone who is almost our, our level, but not quite and always ahead of us. Whereas in the case of the Buddha, yes, in terms of reliability, come fully reliable, fully experienced, fully capable and compassionate in sharing, yet at the same time, having become fully awakened by which they become what they are to us as, as, as completely enlightened, reliable being. Because of that, it seems sometimes little distant for us. So both of their roles come in here when it comes to how to, how to go about doing what the needful is, which is taming oneself, taming one's mind. Otherwise, sometimes people think that, oh, when we say, oh, oneself is one's mother, no, oneself is one's, one's protector, one's refuge, who else is one's protector? Sometimes people take it too literally, too liberally, and say, oh, what is the expression? Carte, carte blanche, what is that? Oh, carte oh, blanche, oh, yeah. Blanche. Card blows. Full advantage. Yeah. yeah, taking full advantage. Like, like you have the full freedom, do whatever you like. That's not the way it is because, because that's not how things happen. How things, how things, how things behave, how things happen. Just merely doing for the sake of doing is not necessarily going to land us into what we want. Unless, unless that's what we want, this will land wherever it does. So, so that's why. So earlier when we had, what was that? Do not commit unwholesome actions, per perform perfectly wholesome actions. And what was that? Rangisim ni yong do. Thoroughly tame your mind. Yeah, so it, in, in taming one's mind, that's where we need the help of someone we could fully rely on because of their own perfected experience and someone close by to almost feel like you can catch up with, but not quite yet, yet carrying first-hand experience of whatever corresponding level of achievement they may be in. Okay, so what else is there? Let me check. Yeah, earlier, the meditation that we were doing, 
for the first few few days until today, we did it all on ourselves primarily. Because to feel compassionate towards others, particularly compassionate of the of the sufferings in samsara and the obstacles, right? Compassionate over the obstacles that is in the way of people's realizing their full potential. Well, one has to have some sense of, some sense of, uh, one has to have a genuine sense of something being wrong, right? Otherwise, if one's perspective towards samsara is like, ah, this is so beautiful. This is something that I can spend, that, that I will not change the world for it. This is awesome. <laughs> Then, then one wouldn't one wouldn't generate a sense for others to be freed from samsara. If at all one does and claims so, it's almost like driving them away from where you want to be. <laughs> so there's this need, particularly when it comes to compassion in the in the strict Buddhist perspective of really taking samsara seriously, and also the prospect. The wonderful privilege and the prospect that that, that this 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 uh, human birth uh, holds, right? And then how it is fleeting. Yet at the same time, yet at the same time, everything goes everything goes by the rule, by karmic rule. One cannot avoid that. Right? One may avoid being being noticed by others, but no, the, 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 the rule of karma. It's something that one has to one has to one has to uh, undergo, right? Irrespective. And in a way it is very clear because when we when we undertake things, undertake things, etc., we do so with our own level of with our own level of weaknesses, with our own level of uh, shortcomings and whatnot. Because of that, and we indulge in that, and that remains with us, and we have to succumb to its consequences. There is no way we can escape from that. And the only way we can do that is by clearing that field. Of course, we can seek support and help from others in terms of recognizing the field, field and how to go about clearing it. But the clearing, we have to do it. So this, this one, this, this, this stanza from uh, Shantideva's is very telling. If those beings have never before even dreamt of such an attitude for their own sake, how would it ever arise for the sake of others? He was speaking of, he was speaking of compassion. How could one generate compassion for others to be freed from suffering, from samsara, if one has not even dreamed to be freed from samsara for oneself? If one has not generated the spirit of renunciation on oneself, how could one ever generate genuine compassion for others? And this, and this can be applied to our day-to-day -day life situations also. That's why Buddha started with saying, this is suffering, right? So can he, he really made sure that people first recognize, not mix up, but recognize unmistakably what sufferings are as sufferings. We, uh, so I think uh, I, don't, I do not need to uh, go on on this, right? But I wanted to point to this and there is this, need for us as genuine seekers to be really serious with uh, our with our practice and i was saying have to be very much on alert in terms of in terms of in terms of uh in terms of uh, what do you call uh in terms of dis discriminating or in terms of uh, identifying the differences, identifying what is as 
what is a statement or what is a path that could fit in a wider perspective, irrespective of particular religious beliefs and whatnot? And what is it that fits within that particular perspective paradigm? So there's this need of really uh, uh, sorting them for oneself and while utilizing them, utilizing them uh, appropriately, skillfully. And particularly when it comes to yourself, oneself, not to mix them up. And so, yeah, I think I, think I said enough on this. So yeah, this, this one is, I, I think I mentioned it, but I, would, I, want, I want to share it here in Tsongkhapa's great treatise. Now, when it comes to how to increase and strengthen your practice, particularly of compassion and whatnot, and then in a way applicable to all spiritual practice, if you reflect from numerous viewpoints on how beings lack happiness and have suffering, you will develop much loving kindness and compassion. Now here, here he is speaking in relation to loving kindness and compassion. But he says in that, in that same breath, the, at the end saying, this is applicable to all practices that one is, one is seeking to cultivate. That in general, these, these broad guidelines have to, be, have to be kept in mind, have to be upheld. One is seeking numerous viewpoints, seeking numerous approaches to a particular pr pr practice. And then when one is cultivating it, do it with seriousness, right? With seriousness in the sense, try to have a, have a stable mental base upon which you do it, which means doing it intently, being, being there mindfully, right? Not with the mind kind of, with my, with, not with the mental base kind of shaky, thinking of this, that, that, and entertaining all these different thoughts, right? Then. Nothing can take root there. And then the third one is doing it for, on a regular basis for a long time. So he says this in, in, his, in, in, in the great treatise. If you reflect from numerous waypoints or numerous approaches on how beings lack happiness and have suffering, you will develop much loving kindness and compassion. I think I have taken this from some text, but what it means is, one will be able to develop loving kindness and compassion in so many different ways. It, 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 it speaks of many different ways, many different, yeah, through many, in, in many different, in many different ways, one will be able to generate it. Not just have to stick to one, one, just one way, but rather will be able to arrive at loving, a kind, loving kindness and, and, and compassion uh, through so many different uh, avenues through through so many different alleys alleyways and then when you're practicing it if you re reflect with seriousness on how things how beings lack happiness and have suffering you will develop strong right there's this chance of it taking root strong loving kindness and compassion now moreover if you think about this for a long time on a regular basis, your loving kindness and compassion will be strong and steady. Therefore, therefore he, he comes to his, his, his conclusion saying, not just be merely content with a small text dealing with a particular topic and think that that's all, rather try to study, rather try to study classical texts. By that he meant heavy duty, Chen, big treatises, which are something accessible to everyone, which are something approachable by everyone, which are not tailored to one specific person, which is usually the case with the pity teachings. They are very pity, really heavy, but the way they, they are presented may not necessarily connect, resonate with everyone. And there are I think even in the words of His Holiness, there are chances of people kind of even uh, being, uh, e even, even 
not only not benefiting, but even being affected adversely, adversely, by, adversely by that because of, because of the mismatch between the teaching and who you are as, as a person. So usually the, the PT teachings are by the great adepts and whatnot, but they are kind of fine-tuned and what do you call it, tailored to their specific, very ripe disciple who have big, what do you call it? big, uh, already built uh, Dharma dispositions just ready to ripen. For which mere showing something, mere sharing one thing, whatnot would be enough. But we cannot, we cannot, unless, I mean, each one of us is a witness to oneself. So one has to judge and be aware of this availability of the other Be, 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 be aware of the availability of this highway that everyone is taking. It may take a little longer, but it's the highway and there's so many lanes. Not just insist on a, on a squeaky, quick uphill path. <laughs> okay. Moreover, if you think about this for a long time, your loving kindness and compassion will be strong and steady. Therefore, if you are satisfied with just a little personal instruction, so that's what he meant, personal, personalized, tailored instruction, and neglect to familiarize yourself with the explanations of the classical text, your compassion and loving kindness will be very weak, will lack the needed ground and foundation. So this is, this is the instruction for general practitioners. There may be some exceptions for whom the other one would be fitting. So one has to look for oneself where one fits. Look at one's mental continuum. Does a mere, does a mere mention of something kind of really sparks and, 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 and kind, of, kind of, aha, kind of everything kind of falls in place then it's, it's exception, <laughs> otherwise it's difficult. Particularly when it comes to understanding emptiness, the subtle dependent origination, maybe I cannot recite it verbatim now, but if you look at Tsongkhapa's own, I think that's, that is, either, it, either his, his destiny fulfilled I think it's, it's, it's his destiny fulfilled. There he says that for the Suru Tongwas, for the beginners, the approach to a emptiness and subtle different origination is through logical means, through inference and logical means, not through a pity one-liner or two that will unlock everything. And likewise, he says this, what was that? Uh, yeah, likewise, he says that uh, for beginners to, de to develop compassion and whatnot, one should be very cl clear about first training on oneself in developing. In, in, in seeing through the situation of samsara and, and developing a genuinely rooted, well-informed sense of disenchantment. Only then one can begin to have compassion. Not everyone who has compassion has to always run through having this, uh, uh, having this disenchantment. Uh, some would have already grown in it and it would have already been in place. Uh, but uh, for beginners, that's very important. Likewise, when we were speaking of the, 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 the practice of patience and the, and, and the ad adversities and adverse adversaries as the cause, that has to be understood in perspective. It's not that anyone who has compassion has to always have someone who is adverse to them. 
but rather when we begin to develop that, one has to have an adversity or an adverse adversary to relate to by which one begin to develop the fledging practice of compassion, patience, and then build. And then eventually that patience, patience, the practice of patience, tolerance, uh, endurance, forbearance will stay put, will grow because the cause was there and had given rise to the effect and effect is there lasting. So there's no need for cause to always spring up by its side. Okay. Yeah, I think this part is in interesting. I, I do not see it. Okay. Okay. So here it is talking about the need of the help of wisdom. Uh, help of wisdom to complement all of one's practices of the six perfections, including uh, before that, uh, the practice of compassion, bodhicitta, uh, others. But there's this need for wisdom to be sought and by which uh, the practice could be kept on track instead of spilling over into the extremes. I think this is from uh, this is from Arya Sura's Compendium of Perfections, Paramita Samas Samasa, and it's a quote from him. It's in 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 poetical form. Even bodhisattvas possessed of great kingdoms who have sensory objects similar to divine substances, right? Remain uncorrupted in their very nature. This is the power of having the virtue of wisdom as their minister. So it, it is giving that metaphor of minister, king, whatnot, but basically saying that even finding oneself in the midst of, in the midst of uh, what do you call in the midst of uh, in the midst of the objects of uh, indulgence, objects of attachment and whatnot, uh, with the help of wisdom, one can still uh, remain uncorrupted in one's practice, if at all, even grow stronger uh, in one's practice by the fact of being in the midst of filth, in the midst of distractions, in the midst of temptations. But that can only happen with the virtue of wisdom. That's general. Now comes the practice of loving kindness, inseparable from helping others. So it's, it locates loving kindness in its nature. It's saying it's utterly free of stain from attachment. One could be loving, but not attached. One can see how attachment brings in element of stickiness, of being stuck, of being protect, overprotective, of being ruling, of being, uh, what do you call, owning and exercising rule over others, of subjugating, whereas loving kindness, with the help of wisdom, can be utterly free, free from that stain of overreach. And then come their compassion, unable to bear for others to suffer, but never succumbs itself to laziness due to the burden of stress. I think this one could be replaced by burnout. Mm -hmm. Their compassion, unable to bear, the, bear for others to suffer, but with the aid of wisdom that sees things clearly unmixed, one would never succumb. No one's compassion would never slide into, right? Into a sense of almost numbness or almost some kind of a distress 
or a burnout due to the burden of distress. In the case of the practice of joy, possess of supreme joy, they do not waver from the real. This is something to be watched also. Sometimes we get so ecstatic, we kind of, uh, kind of reveal in what we have achieved. And then what we have achieved for a half an hour can last for hours and hours of frivolous, frivolous indulgence that would have completely undone what we had just barely achieved in an hour, in an hour or so before. So it's saying, possess of supreme joy, but one would still stay on track and would not waver from the real. One would still be connected with the reality, not be carried away by the projection of unfounded colorfulness and undo what one has just very barely achieved a little. The great impartiality, like their practice of equanimity, never neglects the welfare of beings. It will not slide into indifference, bias, or uh, inaction, but rather would provide that needed ground of equity, needed ground of balance for all the required practices to grow robust, robustly. So these are all due to the help of great wisdom that removes all that would counteract. Great wisdom removes all that would counteract these good qualities. So one would always have to seek the wisdom to, to be with whatever practice. That in a way, to not just carry it away and be content with whatever Kind of some kind of a feeling one is able to generate, but kind of ground it to the reality and let that be kind of complemented by, or what do you call, uh, spiced by wisdom that sees the reality for what it is and sees where it could go, where it could go off kilter and counteract that. Great wisdom removes all that would counteract these good qualities, and so it beautifies them. I think I will stop it here. I think by way of, this was just a man, a meant to kind of complement what we had covered. I thought uh, particularly about what it takes to practice uh, and what are the main components of practicing compassion. In the case of compassion, very interestingly, when it comes to co generating compassion for ourselves or a sense of concern over our miseries and whatnot, all we need, all we need is, all we need is ourselves. We already have this ingrained sense uh, of, of of this acknowledgement that what I want is joy and happiness, and this is not joy and happiness. I need to get over it. And nor is there the need to wait for a sense of sense of kindness or sense of being benefited or indebted to oneself to kind of intervene and and to kind of mediate and provide a stimulus or a, or, or bolster it. When it comes to others. Yes, one has to first and foremost work on how there should not be any difference in, in, in how we consider others to be rightfully worthy of being happy, rightfully worthy of being freed from suffering. Because, on, on, because, because there, there is no difference whatsoever. The reason why you consider yourself rightful rightfully deserving of joy and happiness is because that's what you want. And that should totally apply to others. And that's the practice of equalizing, equalizing not just seeing that others also want happiness like me, others do not want suffering like me. On the basis of that, a total recognition and total allowance that yes, they should be able to pursue it fully as I am able to. And not only they should, but one should be training in projecting that equality and kind of generating it as 
as spontaneous as one has that on oneself. Then make the next step of even cherishing them more than oneself. But right now here is not only seeing them to be equally, equally wishing happiness and not wanting suffering, but because of that, from one side, one should not have kind of a disparity in how one wishes one to have happiness and, and, and how one wishes others to have happiness. So there should not be a disparity. In the Tibetan term, we say rinkung. There should not be, there should not be a difference in the length, in, 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 in how far they go. In oneself, it goes very deep, and others, it kind of, uh, what do you call, it stops halfway, not like that. And then on that basis, when it comes to developing compassion and whatnot for others, now there's this added requirement, added training, added requirement of seeing the connection clearly in seeing how one is indebted, how one is de dependent, how we are connected, how others are contributing, how others are essential, how others, irrespective of whatever their situation may be, are always there making themselves accessible for us, just provided we have the, the right awareness and right angle in relating to them to kind of really, at any given time, be so generously benefited by. That part one doesn't have to cultivate on oneself. Merely knowing that why I want happiness, I do not suffering is enough for one to generate a sense of concern over unwanted sufferings that you, are, that you generate. But on the others, just merely working on that level of the equality is not enough. Now one has to generate, one has to mediate it with this, with this generation, with this cultivation training in feeling cherished. In, in seeing them cherished, beloved. And that comes by seeing how, how much they mean to oneself. And the better it is, the better off, the more stable it is going to be if the reasons that you come up with are something applicable to everyone irrespective. In terms of the nitty gritty, what do you call, Details of it, it may, it may vary, but on the, on the whole, it's because one is unceasingly, generously, unstintedly being benefited by others. And all things that we aspire, that cherish, that we think we have the, we, we have the, uh, we, we have the right, we deserve to develop, and that we see a purpose in developing, they have to come from others, not something that we can point at. It's directly, indirectly, almost like everyone has a role. In this regard, Gung Tang, Gung Tang has given this, this, uh, this example. Suppose there are 100 lamps lighted, and the room is lighted by 100 lamps, each one would be contributing to the, to the brightness in the, in the room. But when you take one light away, you may not notice it. But in terms of its contribution, there shouldn't be any question at all. To that, to that aspect, it would be affecting the, 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 the environment that would be affecting the ambiance in the room. And that would be clearer if you take more and more and more away. So we can use this in terms of how our collective karma is because of our collective community. And when somebody, somebody's term is all up, when, when somebody's time is up and he leaves, he leaves, he leaves, but he, his, his contribution of collective karma aspect is also leaves with him. In a way, on very practical reasons, we can see how somebody being around really 
uh, helps in taking care of the plants and how, where they walk, how they walk, how they treat, etc. cetera, kind of really has an effect on the environment. And when they are gone, even if somebody were to kind of replace them and mimic them, there would still be changes. There will still be differences. There will still be things that will not be built up. To that extent, the environment is not affected in the same way it was before. Something has been withdrawn. So this, this, this particular analogy is so helpful in, in, knowing, in knowing different aspects of, of the Buddhist paradigm in the, of, of the Buddhist, uh, Buddhist way of looking at the world, but and including that of our effectiveness of, of how, irrespective of how someone being so far away and we don't even know they existed, affects us. We are connected. In a way, the pandemic really helped, right? In, in seeing how, how we are connected. So much so that we are really kind of, we are kind of re, uh, helpless. We, we are kind of, uh, what do you call, compelled to say, thank you so much for taking care of yourself because that is taking care of me. Indeed, they may or may not intend to take care of us, but by taking care of themselves, by etc., even with the selfish interest, it is affecting us. And many people do that, not for their selfish interests, but for the interest of the others, saying that, yes, I may not want to take the vaccine, but I do because I care for others. I don't want others to be sick. So irrespective of what kind of a motivation they come up with in doing how, what they do in protecting themselves, we are as affected. So when somebody says, when, when somebody responds by, when you ask, how are you? I'm well, are you happy? Yes, I'm happy. One is compelled to say, thank you so much. To the extent you are happy, you are affecting the environment that I share with you. So if we, it, it's just a matter of whether we think about this or not. If we think there, there is no dearth of reason, it's not like, oh, now I have run out of, out of reasons, um, run out of avenues by which I can think of the connectedness. Oh, it is so amazing. It is to that effect that yes, sentient beings, sentient beings are really, really, really precious, as precious as Buddhas are in their own very distinct ways that one cannot replace the other. That's why in Tibetan, we use this epithet, we use this prefix to the sentient beings when we re re refer to them uh, through this, through, uh, by way of their, their kindness, not necessarily meaningly kind, but in, in one way or the other, uh, kind of receiving kindness from them. We call, we call them Cho, Cho Semjen. Semjen is the Tibetan term for sentient being. Right? Semchen is the Tibetan term for sentient being. And we say cho. I'm at loss in how to con convey this in Tibetan because cho in one, one, one sense means master, revered. So maybe the, in that sense, they are to be revered. They are to be really respected and upheld for what they mean to us, how, how they, what they provide to us without any stinginess, not without any constraint, they kind of keep giving with whatever they do, including their being hard, harsh to us. Mm -hmm. It is really amazing. It's just a matter of, and then there's no need of really looking hard anywhere. It's just, just, a, matter of, just a matter of swinging your head. It's like everywhere. Okay, so uh, so we're not sharing screen, right? Okay, mm -hmm. so let me push one, two, three stanzas. <laughs> uh, in a way, I pushed the most number of stanzas today. 
Uh, I don't know if you will agree with me or not. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, you see the screen, right? Yeah. Okay. So where is it? Uh, Yep, stanza 19. Although Shravakas and Prateka Buddhas, yeah, so 17, 17, 18 was the same reason proves that the Dharma and the Sangha are also fitting objects of refuge. Hence, you are the chief arbiter, distinguishing what is an object of refuge from what is not. Primarily, Buddha is an object of refuge because of his or her compassion. Thinking of how compassion at the beginning led them on the path, how they, they were nurtured on the path, how, how, they were, how they were put on the path by compassion, how in the middle they were nurtured by compassion, how at the end they, they, are, they are sustained and retained for us uh, to access by virtue of compassion, likewise. Through their compassion, they give birth to Sangha. And Sangha are defined by the Dharma within them. And because of the Dharma, the Sangha's sparkle and the Sangha's exude way for us through their example, through their words, but more so through their examples. And that's because of the Dharma within them. And the generation of Dharma within the Sangha, these are all from the Buddhas. So they are also fitting objects of refuge because of you, because of, you, of, of the compassion. And then even in the case of the Sanghas as themselves, for being who they are, with their integrity, whatnot, They are held by compassion. Hence, you are the chief arbiter distinguishing what is an object of refuge from what is not. Yeah, for someone that we can rely on, someone that can really trust, they have to have. Now, someone that we, so th there's a difference, the sentient beings, as much as they mean to us, they are not necessarily something that you could go for refuge into, right? <laughs> or, 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 or necessarily trust them. So, the, so, so what do you call? Uh, appreciating their role doesn't necessarily entail blindly trusting them, right? No, blindly going for refuge and, and seeking protection in them and, 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 and following their lead, no. That is only possible when somebody has compassion, genuine compassion in them, complemented by insight, whatnot, knowledge, etc. Without compassion, one can one can see this in the world. How, although we may succeed in taking them in stride, but themselves they themselves suffer from them, and their actions, even if it, they may be, they may mean something to us, but by their action the way they engage in them by indulging the negativities, they incur their own karmic consequences. But right then and there, they do, not, they do not have good time. And then they completely ruin, are blinded by their own afflictions and ruin their prospect. So that, that doesn't make them a refuge, a word, an object of refuge for us. And, and this object of refuge that's worthy of going for refuge in and have the hope of really receiving the protection is, I mean, almost exclusively because of compassion. Because of that, all other qualities needed could come. Without that, all other kind of qualities, even in place, will not, will not be will not be worth going into refuge, will not be worth trusting into. In its absence, everything that gathers, in its absence, no matter how much, how many, how varied it may be, 
the more it is a collection of without compassion, the more dangerous it can become. Okay. Uh, okay. Then stanza 19. Although Shravakas and Prayeki Buddhas can remain in equipoise, equipoise for many hundreds of eons due to the power of their concentration, they have, net, they have not paid you any attention and so are constrained to sleep for a long time in a gulf of peacefulness, in a gulf of individual peacefulness, right? So, Shravakas and Prateke Buddhas, through their effort, through their practice, through their integrity, they may achieve wonderful practices, wonderful realizations on the path, but the most these paths can lead to is individual liberation. They may have compassion for others, but because of the complacency in nirvana, in personal nirvana, right? Because of the complacency in personal nirvana, they have not sought practices like bodhicitta and others, uh, nor are they skilled in, in, in really taking uh, others on the path to Buddhahood, on the path to full awakening by which not only the being itself or herself becomes fully awakened, but would be fully equipped to benefit all sentient beings irrespective. Because of what they have chosen, they are, uh, they are capable of affecting, benefiting sentient beings only so much, but not with a full Full, full, not with their full potential uh, realized. So this is all from the perspective of a bodhisattva. Let me read the next one, 20. But the perfect Buddhas, so because this is contrasting with the previous one, but the perfect Buddhas and Bodhisattvas have already offered into your hands whatever authority they have. And so they remain benefiting others until the end of existence. Just imagine uh, the full throttle of offering of themselves in, to the service of others. And that too, with the smart choices that they make for themselves so that ultimately the sentient beings will benefit. Every second, every moment of their, of their life, of their being is, 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 like, is like fully welcoming to others, fully offered to others with nothing concerning it. Yeah, while at the same time, always in the, in the midst of, in the process of figuring out what would be the best to go about it so that they could double down on being of service to the others. So it's not just a naive commitment to kind of being of service to others, but rather a very well, uh, what do you call, very well developed, informed, uh, smart uh, choice and smart approach. That's why in the, in the scriptures, it says that as much as wishing for other sentient beings to er attain full awakening is part of the Bodhisattva's training, so much is the training in this conviction that it is by themselves arriving at the full awakening, which on the face value, which on the surface looks like their self-interest, right? That is considered even, that is considered as important 
So that speaks of the smartness of their choice of how they are going, how they have committed to go about serving others. Because there are, there is no other way. It's only by being, by perfecting themselves, by attaining the state of full awakening with all the positive potentials fulfilled that they can be, that they can present themselves, uh, that, that they can stand out there available for others to be benefited fully. At least on their part, there will be nothing lacking, nothing wanting. If sentient beings choose to turn away and not seek help whatsoever, don't see any value in it, and what can Buddhas and Bodhisattvas do? But on their part, they did their best in developing themselves, in generating themselves, growing themselves, nurturing themselves into this fully awakened, fully compassionate, fully knowing, fully caring being, ever present, available. So that's why in the Buddhist context, this practice of remembrance, recollection that we spoke of earlier, of Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, as well as the practice of generosity, concentration, uh, in some cases, uh, uh, in some cases, uh, mm, wisdom, I think, uh, in some cases, uh, morality. This is considered very important because it's, all it takes for us to benefit is for us to garner, for us to uh, come up with our part of reaching out. The others has already extended its hand. It's like that. For one to have a hand check, one has to, all one has to do is one has to extend one hand. The other hand is already extended there. So we, you cannot blame that you didn't, you, you didn't get a hand check because you didn't extend it. The other hand is already extended. So that's the reason with the mind remembering them, it itself kind of forms into some kind of a conducive receptacle to receive some, if you will, blessing, some benefit, some tinge of that environment, some tinge of that, of that flavor of spiritual integrity. I think I will leave it here. Or oh, for the sake of some auspiciousness, 21 Aras, I will just read the 20, 21st, 21. As an inferior mind like my own sees it, when people think of you, compassion, you earnestly worry. They earnestly worry that all the sufferings of other beings would now come there, be, become theirs to remedy. Whereas in reality, that is not the case. So, People do take time in getting to know you. And thus, before they actually know you, they have total misinterpretation, misreading of you, thinking that with you in their life, all they would end up having is not only their own suffering retained, but, add, but added with the sufferings of others, mm -hmm. poor sentient beings. Mm -hmm. But once they get close to you and get to uh, be friend with you, and embrace you, they will see the miracle that you are. Mm -hmm. Okay, with that miracle, we will leave it here. For questions and answers, yeah. Thank you, Geshe-la. Can you tell us where you uh, learned the Pali verses um, to sing? That's very beautiful how you did that. And I have another question. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, actually, it's strange. I learned this in Varanasi. I had my colleagues, Pali teachers, Pali friends, Pali students, as well as some... Uh, scholars in the research who know, know Sanskrit and Pali well. So I checked with them. I asked what the words looks like. And then I checked with them and I had them sing for me. That's how I learned. 
And then I occasionally look up uh, teachings by uh, Theravada elders, uh, Buddhist Theravada elders. Uh, oh, it's so touching. The simplicity, the contentment, and uh, the sincerity with which they teach and they present, they make themselves available to others. It's so touching. So that's where I get drawn to and I occasionally indulge in them. And that's how sometimes I get them sing this. Thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. I have a question in, uh, for example, in Germany, um, there was just recently a group of young people um, in the teens who uh, went on a hunger strike for 40 days um, with the request that the politicians in Germany um, pay stronger attention to the environment and make um, certain laws uh, or go into that direction to make certain laws um, for their future, for the young people's future. And so then in the end, even two people um, continued um, without water, but then, um, then it was clear that they wouldn't survive it if they continue on that too. So in that regard, I was questioning myself um, how much that is really a compassionate action. Um, I don't see it like that, but when we speak about create compassion, and you are now speaking about the connection we have all with each other, I wondered if somebody really has great compassion and does an action like a hunger strike that may have had a very big impact on people, but I really can't explain it why. Um, otherwise, um, it needs the compassion of others <laughs> um, to understand what the people are demanding or asking for. So if you can maybe share your thoughts on that. Yeah. I don't know if I <laughs> At the, Towards the end of uh, what you shared uh, by way of sharing and also asking questions, uh, you said that uh, we need compassion of others. Merely having compassion on your part is not enough for actual actions to happen. We need compassion of others. This is very telling. This is very telling. Now the question is, how do we get that? How do we get that? So what puts them off? Uh, in, in terms of a social change, yes, we need the cooperation of others and then cooperation of others in the best spirit would be if they are as concerned and as compassionate, as caring. But if that's not forthcoming, how do we, how do we, how do we go about creating that? How do we go about creating that? Usually, I have I have this. Maybe I will not I will not share this to just discourage you. <laughs> but but the main thing is, as I shared with you uh, that that Varanasi episode. Uh, it is so important to train, not merely have people kind of worked up and emotionally charged about situation as how, no matter how sincere they may be and how willing they may be to sacrifice things. But together with that, they have to be, I don't know, informed, educated, in how going through all these, they could still steer themselves with a sense of, with a sense of, should I say, mental peace, mental ease, mental calmness, uh, by knowing that giving into negative thinking, so that's the reason why I was saying, if you say anger is natural, hatred is natural, that's almost like giving them some kind of a, uh, okay, kind of a green light saying, yes, generate this, this is okay. Whereas when, when one gives into that, that not only makes their life horrible, but their decisions, their way of looking at others, their way of re, uh, relating to others, and then the prospect of resolving the situation, particularly in the long run. 
gets really, really, really compromised. But at the same time, I would say, as much as we see the need of really kind of nurturing the mental health, mental, yeah, mental, mental health in the sense of really knowing uh, where it lies, how to maintain it, what not, it, this needs to be promoted. More, more work needs to be done creatively to not only get some physical things to things done, of course those are, those are important, but not prioritize, prioritize it to the, to the, at, at, the, at the service, at the, at the expense of, at the expense of neglecting the mental cultivation. So that's why in India, when Gandhiji was there and others were there for the nonviolent uh, protest and whatnot, likewise here in, in, in the US also with the civil, uh, civil rights movement and whatnot, the leaders really saw, the genuine leaders really saw the need of getting people grounded in the notion of nonviolence. They had to kind of, they took time in training people I mean, of course, to that extent, that would have definitely, without question, have had added force and stamina and uh, resilience to the movement, I think. But more needs to be done. Very, very interestingly, I heard His Holiness of the Dalai Lama in one of the teachings that I was listening to. He said that in, in the past, People would, in, in, the, in, in the scriptures, when we speak of high masters, advanced masters, we speak of uh, their qualities in, in this succinct way, in a summarized way. Ke Tun Sang, expert, scholar, Tun is with good concentration practice, Sang, compassionate, kind, that aspect, all combined together makes them who they are, the unique, respectable masters that not only were better off themselves personally, but were kind of exuding that glow, peace for others to learn from. But those qualities only got confined in the monasteries or in the ashrams or with the individuals that we kind of point to as, as, as high masters. Now he says that if we, want, if, we, if we make an effort, the whole of Tibetan community has the foundation, has the way of vital to everyone train in that and everyone become it. How do we rally them around it? Some some kind of a some kind of a well-meaning, trusted, uh, appealing to sent or, or to the masses. Someone who kind of really breaks through the barriers and kind of speak louder than anything through their own integrity, action, speech. And all many, many of them, many like that, really needs to take the leading, the leading role. Uh, we we can't we can't just merely do with we can't just merely do with the leaders that we have. That's not enough. Yeah. So so basically, it comes to that. It comes to that merely doing, merely coming with a with a strategy, and, and it needs to be really thought through. But deep down, it has to be grounded in not harming anyone, ruling out totally that when it comes to harming, I stop there, and that has to be a collective attitude rooted in conviction. And then let actions, thoughts, 
planning strategies come out of that. I think that could speak much louder. And that's this, that, that should be the, the, the broad strategy, I think, the way of going about it and not leave, leave, leave it to just one single person or single individual heading a movement here and there, but rather uh, some kind of a well-planned training, more particularly, not just in the, in, the, in, the, in the logistics of how to go about things, but rather, but also in the, in the, in the mindset mindset uh, with the prospect of really looking wide and looking far. Yeah, that's all I, 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 can, I can share uh, at this moment. And then on our individual parts, we need to do our part in, 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 in sending the message to others, like with the environment, kind of don't use plastics, buy your own bags. And, 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 be, and make special, special effort in remembering to have them at hand and use them uh, like that. But at the same time, not going overboard in kind of really instructing others or teaching uh, kind of teaching others without their uh, without their uh, what is that without their what do you call without their consent without their permission without their cooperation so like likewise uh, the things that we need to do And then yes, cut down on the needs. Cut down on the needs. Yeah, I did some when I was trying to move out. And I could see how you how it is possible to do. At one point, at, at at close to moving out, all I kept was one spoon, one fork, one cup, one plate, like that, and was kind of making do with that days and days after that. Ah, oh, it is possible, and. Not just that, it, it, all the plates get very clean. Nothing is left there to be washed later. Oh, you can clean them, all them. And then you can do it. At one point, I even thought of suggesting that everybody take their spoon and their cup with them whenever they go out to eat. And not have uh, restaurants to keep so many in stack that are not used or else have everyone use uh, reusable plates and whatnot, something like that. So, so there may be ways by which we could be an example that could speak stronger. But deep down, it has to be really spiritual integrity, not, one, not again getting inflated with what you do and then look down upon others. Let that be an encroachment and criticizing. None of that. So there's this need of individually training, growing so integrally in this, and then expanding that. And then, what do you call, uh, replicating that across the society. OK. And so, Geshela, we would love to, um, of course, be able to come to you with a kata in our hands one by one. 
but we'll do it all together collectively. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We make our offering. Um, always you give so much to expand our hearts and to expand our thinking and the collective karma that we create to share this dharma journey with you is so very precious um i looked back to see that you first came to the abbey in 2008 and you have given us so many teachings annually now since 2015 talking to us about the tenets and madhyama through metaphors and that took us a few years um, going through the six perfections took us a few years, and now it looks like this beautiful text is also going to take us together in a journey for quite a while, for which we rejoice. Um, and so we hope that we will have the opportunity many, many, many times to share the Dharma with you, to hear from you and learn from you and grow with you, and uh, welcome you back to the Abbey again and again and again, in person or in Zoom, however. And also, please do not forget that you have a home here. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I always remember that. Yes, and I'm, I'm, I genuinely, sincerely mean that. I, I get really moved when I think of how much this, this friendship, this acquaintance, this connection with the Abbey has meant to me personally, and then through that, hopefully, to others also. This has been a wonderful, wonderful journey for me. And you are a big part in that. So I should be as grateful, even more grateful for all you are offering, maybe not knowingly, but I know how much you have meant to me. Well, and also behind the scenes, the amount of work that you do with Venerable Children on the Library of Wisdom Compassion and have for many years, years and years and years that we don't even know, just the two of you, I think, know. <laughs> um, that is a, a treasure that um, really kind of quietly, both of you really spreading to the world for who knows how long that um, the benefit from that will grow and grow and grow. So Venerable also may want to say a few words. <laughs> <laughs> I can't really say much more. Um, she's much more articulate and eloquent, eloquent about these kinds of things than I am. But we, um, yeah, we really appreciate your continued um, interest and support of the Abbey and of uh, our personal progress along the path and taking the time to teach us and answer questions and, uh, and practice patience and fortitude. <laughs> 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 so yeah, please come many times, uh, Geshe-la, to teach here. Thank you so much. I will come definitely, but not, not to teach. I will do what I'm doing. <laughs> I do not consider this teaching. I'm considering this, if at all, learning. learning. So I will definitely come to learn more and more and more. <laughs> if that's what you want me to do. <laughs> yeah. And we will invite and, again and again yeah. and again. Yes, thank, and you. Also, thank you. Just to have some resting time from all of your uh, very hectic life, it sounds like, <laughs> you know? in trying to make time to work on the book. He's so busy in this and that and the other thing. And so I think you also need some, what we call R&R, &R, which is rest and realization. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, uh, just free of all of that, uh, people knocking on your door for things to give you some personal time and space. Mm -hmm. So please take that, no matter where you need to be, but take care of yourself. Thank you. Thank you for this reminder. I, I really need that. And, and I've been, <laughs> uh, I've been uh, managing somewhat in, in getting that. So but I will keep this, uh, hold this in my heart. And yes, thank you. Because for the benefit of sentient beings, Geshe-la, we need you to lead, live for a very long time. <laughs> well, Geshe, who was here, that just taught us that when we take care of ourselves, we're taking care of others. Do you remember? <laughs> yeah? Just, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm Geshe who said that to us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some Geshe is really taking care of. Let me tell you. What I do, I do yoga. I do jogging. 
I walk in the park, which has deer, uh, 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 what's that, geese, uh, uh, geese and uh, gooselings. Oh, all the time I go. So I almost go there almost every day or the, uh, every other day, uh, unless I'm too busy, like, like during these sessions, then I kind of say, okay, maybe I skip this. So I'm, I'm, I'm doing my best in, in taking good care. So uh, don't worry as much, but nonetheless, I take uh, your words to my heart and then do even better there. <laughs> and so before we make our dedication, there's one request from the second row. They would like for you to say cattywampus at least one time. <laughs> we need to cattywample. Keep on cattywampling because where we are is cattywampus. <laughs> Now I have even learned one another another phrase. Try to cotton on. What? Try to cotton on to new things. Try to understand new things. Don't just be. Uh, yeah, you live in in, in Atlanta. Yeah. That makes sense. <laughs> that we're in the Northwest. It doesn't make sense. <laughs> oh ho! Oh, it isn't. It isn't English. 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 <laughs> English word. But anyway, 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 <laughs> Cody Wumple and Katie Wumpus does work for me. And, and, and always watch that you do not go off kilter. <laughs> <laughs> and keep, what was the other one um, with moles? Whack a mole, yeah. Yeah, whack a mole. Now we cannot. Be satisfied with whack a mole We have to do better. <laughs> we have to hit the nail on the head. <laughs> yeah. We have to do better. That there is no end in just hitting the nail, hitting the head and it pops up uh, every time we do, but rather do it in such a decisive way that when it's hit, it's hit forever. Now it's gone. <laughs> okay. So we'll make a dedication and then folks can stay online for just one second more after that. We'll uh, share oh, okay. and uh, look forward to the next time that we meet. <laughs> May the spiritual teachers who lead me on the sacred path and all spiritual friends who practice it have on life. May I pacify completely all outer and inner hindrances. Grant such inspiration, I pray. May the lives of the venerable spiritual mentors be stable. And their virtuous actions spread in the ten directions. May the light of Losan's teachings dispelling the darkness of the beings in the three worlds always increase. Idam Guru Rahna Mandala Kam Niryatayami. Due to this merit, may we soon attain the awakened state of Guru Buddha, that we may be able to liberate all sentient beings from their suffering. May the precious Bodhi mind not yet born arise and grow. May the born have no decline, but increase forevermore. In the snowy mountain pure land, you're the source of good and happiness. Powerful Tenzing Yatso Chenrezi, may you stay until some sorrow ends. May the deeds of explaining and practicing the Dharma, done by groups supporting the teachings and their upholders, who spread the view of dependent arising 
and nonviolent actions in the ten directions. And especially at Shravasti Abbey in the West. Hola. And Geshila is a U.S. citizen. Right. So we should um, now dedicate with star spangled compassion. Yeah. With, your, with your hand on the heart. <laughs> oh, good. They planned it. Yeah. And oh, should we did. let's stand up and do this? <laughs> May all beings everywhere play by sufferings of body and mind, obtain an ocean of happiness and joy by virtue of my merits. May no living creature suffer, a medieval or ever fall ill. May no one be afraid or belittle with a mind weighed down by depression. May the blind see force and the deaf hear sounds. May those whose bodies are worn with toil be restored on finding repose. May the naked find clothing, the hungry find food. May the thirsty find water, and the May the poor find wealth, those weak with sorrow find joy. May the forlorn find hope, constant happiness and prosperity. May all who are ill or injured quickly be freed from their ailments. Whatever diseases there are in the world, may these never occur again. May the frightened cease to be afraid, and those bound be free. May the powers find power, and may people of benefiting each other for as long as space endures and as long as living beings remain until then may I try to dispel the misery of the world Thank you so much. Thank you so very yeah. much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And for all the folks online, if you had a question about how you would like to make an offering to support these teachings, just go to the Shabasti Abbey website. Uh, the donate page is very clear. Thanks so much for joining us as well. <laughs>